at the AI Seoul Summit, world powers and leading business figures agree upon the safe use and development of artificial intelligence, a key emerging issue for humanity. With the disputes between doctors and the government showing little sign of abating, the Prime Minister once again urges the medical community to come up with a reasonable, unified plan, hoping to find the middle ground. Dozens of fans who have a deep love for Korea are invited to the country for five days for the Visit Korea year. We take a closer look at who they are and how they feel about getting first-hand experience of the culture that they love so much. It's May 22, 2024. This is News Center. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. I'm Yoon Jung Min. World leaders committed to ensuring the safety, innovation, and inclusivity of artificial intelligence in a two-day AI Seoul summit co-hosted by South Korea and the UK. Adopted there was the Seoul Declaration. Our correspondent Woo Soo-young begins our coverage. South Korea, the United Kingdom, the United States and other world powers have called for stronger global cooperation to advance safety, innovation and inclusion in artificial intelligence to further human well-being and democratic values. This came in a joint Seoul declaration following the AI's Seoul summit co-hosted by South Korea and the UK. On Tuesday evening's Seoul time, President Yoon suk yeol and British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak chaired the first closed-door session online, attended by the leaders of the Group of Seven Nations and Singapore and the Vice Presidents of the United States and the European Commission. In his opening remarks, Yoon said that given the hyper-connectivity and borderless nature of the digital space, the world needs common digital norms to first ensure the safety of AI, minimizing the potential negative impact on societies and protecting well-being and democracy. He also called for free and open innovation to stimulate economic growth and tackle global problems like climate change, as well as to ensure all people benefit from the technology. Such points were reflected in this whole declaration reached by the participating countries and Australia. That document calls for enhanced cooperation on governing AI to mitigate risks, while promoting democratic values, human rights, the rule of law and fundamental freedoms. It also raises the need for policy and governance frameworks that support socio-cultural and gender diversity, contribute to sustainable development and help bridge the digital divide. To increase the shared understanding and design of such frameworks, a separate whole statement of intent builds on previous commitments to strengthen global research collaboration on AI safety. The two days Ho summit is a follow-up to the first AI safety summit held in England's Bletchley Park last year, where 28 governments recognised the significant challenges posed by AI, including in cybersecurity, biotechnology and the dissemination of misinformation. While 10 countries and the European Union adopted this whole declaration, you noted it was reached by the heads of state and government, marking an upgrade from last year's ministerial Bletchley declaration. It also expanded the scope of focus from AI safety to include innovation and inclusivity. Recognising the need to engage the core developers of AI, the summit also included leaders of 11 IT giants, including Samsung Electronics, Naver, Amazon, Microsoft, Meta and X, who agreed to adopt the voluntary AI safety commitments to prevent AI-related risks. Broader discussions are expected on Wednesday, with more countries, including China, attending the in-person ministerial session alongside the AI Global Forum to include a wider range of businesses and civil society. Wu Xiang, Arirang News. President Yoon says freedom and solidarity will end the tunnel of global uncertainty. The remarks were made during this year's Asian Leadership Conference here in the country under the theme of the era of hyper-uncertainty, innovative leadership for the new future. He also touched upon Korea's dismal birth rate, adding that this concern is not simply a domestic issue, but one that affects many other countries as well. That being said, he voiced hopes of seeking to better address the low birth rate and of sharing the lessons learned with Korea's counterparts. South Korea has reaffirmed its commitment to continue support for global nuclear security by making a financial contribution. Speaking at an international conference on nuclear security in Vienna on Tuesday, Second Vice Foreign Minister Kang in sun announced that South Korea will contribute two million U.S. dollars to the International Atomic Energy Agency. The money will be used to fund responses to future nuclear security threats.
In addition, Kang said the country would actively participate in ensuring the safety of Ukraine's nuclear power plants. She also met with Rafael Grossi, Director General of the IAEA, and discussed the monitoring of Japan's wastewater release from the destroyed nuclear plant in Fukushima. Rare images have been captured of North Korea leader Kim Jong-un's portrait hanging alongside those of his father and grandfather. The South Korean government says this appears to be part of Kim's attempts to reinforce the cult of personality in the regime. Our North Korean affairs correspondent Kim jong shil explains. The portraits of three generations of leadership in North Korea hanging on the wall have been spotted at a new school in Pyongyang during its opening ceremony. North Korea state-run Korean Central News Agency reported this on Wednesday in its coverage of the event. The portraits of the three leaders from the Kim family can also be seen hanging above the blackboards in the school's classrooms. There were times when either Kim Jong-un's portrait was hung alone or those of his father and grandfather wore. But this is one of the rare moments when all three were hanging side by side. Experts said the motive behind the display could have something to do with Kim's leadership recently facing difficulty due to him going against his predecessor's doctrine, which might have confused the population. I think uh, it came as a, as a big burden when he uh, made a statement that said that uh, in North Korea's policy, there's not going to be any unification because you try to erase the footprints of, of, of the predecessors, his uh, grandfather and, and father. Professor Kim added there could be a clear statement behind the hanging of the portraits together. He wants to portray uh, in part this message that uh, it's not like he's going to uh, eliminate uh, footprints, uh, heritages of, of his predecessors. Rather, he uh, cherishes the accomplishments, achievements that uh, his predecessors made. South Korea's Ministry of Unification said it appears that Kim Jong-un is trying to show off his status and his recent revolutionary ideas, saying it was closely monitoring this rare occasion. Kim Jong-sil, Arirang News. Russia has started exercises simulating the launch of tactical nuclear weapons, as earlier announced by its authorities. It's seen as Moscow sending a message towards the West amid the war in Ukraine. Lee seung has more. Russia's Ministry of Defense announced Tuesday that under the instructions of Russian President Vladimir Putin, the first phase of tactical nuclear drills has begun in Russia's southern military district. The military drills, which are also taking place near Ukraine, simulate the use of nuclear weapons. The move is a response to what Moscow says are threats from the West and a message not to escalate tensions any further. The ministry explained that the tactical nuclear drills include training using the Iskander short-range ballistic missiles and the Kinzhal hypersonic missiles, which are capable of carrying nuclear warheads. Earlier this month, Putin ordered the Defense Ministry to prepare training to test the use of tactical nuclear weapons after the Kremlin took issue with comments made by French President Emmanuel Macron, who mentioned the possibility of sending troops to Ukraine. They also slammed British Foreign Secretary David Cameron, who said that weapons provided to Ukraine could be used to strike the Russian mainland. During his Victory Day speech earlier this month, Putin warned the West that its strategic forces are always ready for combat at all times and indicated that Russian and Belarusian forces have begun joint preparations for tactical nuclear weapons training. Russia's defense ministry on Tuesday released footage showing trucks carrying missiles to a field where launch systems had been set up. The military drills are taking place in Russia's southern military district in Rostov-on-Don, near the Ukrainian border, as well as the Donetsk, Luhansk, Zaporizhia, and Herzon regions, which Russia claims were newly incorporated during its special military operation against Ukraine. Lee seung Arirang News. Tens of thousands of Iranians gathered in Tehran to mourn the late president and other officials who died in a helicopter crash over the weekend. Although many turned out to mourn the late president, the sudden death sparked mixed reactions in Iran. Peyunji has the details. Mourners in black gathered in Tehran on Wednesday, 
some holding photos of the late President Abraham Raisi. Raisi's body was flown in from Tabriz, the closest major city to the remote crash site. Iran's Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei attended the funeral and performed prayers. Hamas chief Ismail Haniyeh and top leaders of Iran's paramilitary Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps were also at the funeral. It took place after Iran on Monday declared five days of mourning. Although many Iranians are mourning the late president, his death comes amid widespread public anger over worsening living standards and tightening political control. The New York Times said some even welcomed the loss, as the 63-year-old was seen as a key figure who oversaw the executions of dissidents and used violence to suppress and kill protesters. The BBC also reported that there was a sharp contrast in the reactions, with opponents celebrating Raisi's death as good news, but added many Iranians do not believe much will change as the country's supreme leader holds ultimate power. Raisi was known for enforcing brutal crackdowns on protests over repressive laws, such as the mandatory hijab rules. Mass protests went on for months in Iran starting in late 2022 over the death of a 22-year-old woman, Malsa Amini, who had been detained over allegedly not wearing a hijab. Following Raisi's death, there were jokes and sarcastic comments on social media, as well as photographs of protesters who were killed or maimed two years ago. Videos of fireworks in several cities across Iran were seen online, and some posted videos of themselves dancing in the streets. Raisi's body will be transferred to his hometown of Mashhad in eastern Iran for burial on Thursday. Pounds, Arirang News. In the Middle East, relief workers are sounding the alarm in Gaza as essential food delivery into Rafah is suspended amid supply shortages and security concerns. Kim bo has this report. Catastrophe nightmare. This is how one United Nations official described the situation in Rafah, calling it hell on earth. After Israel closed the Palestinian side of the Rafah land crossing with Egypt earlier this month, the humanitarian situation has been worsening. According to the UN Agency for Palestinian Refugees on Tuesday, food distribution in Gaza's southern city of Rafah has been suspended due to a lack of supplies. Saying the impact of incursions and evacuation orders are being felt all over Gaza, the head of the World Health Organization called on Israel to lift restrictions on aid into Gaza on Tuesday. At a time when the people of Gaza are facing starvation, we urge Israel to lift the blockade and to let aid through. The UN World Food Program is reportedly re-evaluating logistics, looking for alternative routes within Gaza after deliveries from a U.S.-made pier stopped on Sunday. U.S. President Joe Biden previously ordered the American military's construction of the pier and dock, and the first 10 trucks had entered through the pier on Friday. But this ended up chaotic, with much of the aid looted and one Palestinian man dead, resulting in the aid deliveries being stopped. The WFP said that the peer project for delivering aid to Gaza may fail unless Israel starts providing the conditions the humanitarian groups need to operate safely. Meanwhile, Israel on Tuesday shut down the Associated Press's live camera feed as Israel claimed that the news agency was providing Al Jazeera with content. Israel's communications department returned camera and broadcast equipment it had seized from the media outlet after facing a backlash from U.S. officials and press groups. This comes weeks after Israel shut down Al Jazeera's operations in the country, citing a recently approved law that enables it to temporarily close four networks in Israel that are considered a threat to national security. Kim bo Arirang News. Amid junior doctors extending their walkout, the government is once again urging the medical community to present a reasonable, unified plan and to engage in talks. Our Lee Soo-jin tells us more. 
While the South Korean government and the medical community agree that communication is necessary, the ongoing rift continues as both sides remain at impasse. Prime Minister Han Duk Su in a meeting on Wednesday once again asked the medical community to present a reasonable and unified plan for the medical school admission quota, saying that the government is ready to engage in talks in any form whenever. This comes amid doctor organizations such as the Korean Medical Association and the Korean Intern Resident Association standing firm and demanding that the medical admission quota plan be scrapped before they participate in talks. And only a few junior doctors returned to work on Monday, despite it marking three months since their absence began. Under the relevant law, junior doctors are only allowed up to three months off to qualify for the specialty certification exam the following year. According to a survey conducted by the Health Ministry of 100 major hospitals as of Monday, only 659 junior doctors have returned, which is only 5.1 percent of the total junior doctors in the nation. Prime Minister Han also said that 16 out of the 32 medical schools have completed amendments to their medical school admission plans for next year, with the government also pledging to work closely with the remaining schools. The Korean Council for University Education will hold a University Admissions Committee meeting this week where it will review and approve the amendments submitted and announce the new admission guidelines next week. This comes after the Seoul High Court last Thursday ruled in favor of the government and rejected an application submitted by medical students, exam candidates, professors and trainee doctors to halt the government's plan to expand the number of new medical students by 2000 starting in 2025. And to address the ongoing shortage of doctors at hospitals, the prime minister also pledged to dispatch 120 more doctors from military hospitals starting Thursday, in addition to the 427 military and public health doctors that have already been deployed. Lee Soo-jin, Arirang News. The presidential office and the ruling People Power Party will hold weekly policy coordination meetings for better communication. That's according to a high-ranking official at the top office on Wednesday. The officials said the meeting will be attended by the presidential chief of staff for policy, the PPP's head of policy committee, and the vice minister of finance, among others. The agenda for these weekly meetings will not be revealed, as the group will be discussing ongoing matters that are not yet fully decided. Such a move comes after the government tried to ban non-KC certified items being purchased directly from overseas prompting public backlash while also looking as if the government and the party were not in close coordination. South Korea has reported its third outbreak of African swine fever, an animal disease fatal to pigs this year. The Central Disaster Management Headquarters said on Tuesday that pigs on a farm located in the inter-Korean border county of Cheolwon in Gangwon, the province, were confirmed to have been infected. Under emergency guidelines, about 1,200 pigs raised on the farm will be culled. Also, from Tuesday evening, a 48-hour travel ban was issued for livestock facilities, including slaughterhouses in the province, as well as other vulnerable areas. Following the confirmed case, the authorities pledged to strengthen disinfection and quarantine measures against the deadly animal disease. On the cultural front, the government has designated 2023 to 2024 as Visit Korea Year, and there's much to enjoy if you are interested in visiting the country. As part of the project, dozens of foreign nationals who deeply love or have special ties to Korea have been invited to visit the country. Our culture correspondent Song Yujin brings you this story. It's a dream come true for Zev or Ted, a 76-year-old YouTuber and former programmer. Popular for his Korean drama reviews and songs by his favorite artist, IU, which led IU to invite him to a concert in July, Zev is currently visiting Korea. Though he's visited Korea before, this trip is particularly special. I can't tell you how happy I am. I'm absolutely thrilled. You know, I, I got here at 4.30 in the morning, this morning. So, but I'm too excited to, do, to go lie around in a hotel room, okay? I, they, they said, oh, take a rest and come for the luncheon. No, <laughs> I'm not going to miss anything. It's all Zev is among the 49 invitees in the Korea Invites You program organized by the Culture Ministry and the Korea Tourism Organization. 
So among the more than 77,000 applicants from 185 countries and receiving recommendations from overseas branches of the Korea Tourism Organization, 49 people were chosen for the Korea Invites You program, a five-day trip to Korea where they'll get to experience Korean culture firsthand. We organized this program as part of the 2023 to 2024 Visit Korea Year. Our goal was to invite people from around the world who have a deep love and interest in Korea, as well as those with unique stories connected to our country. We want to show our appreciation for their ongoing support and share new and exciting aspects of Korean culture with them. Take Chun Yee Chen, for example. She and her nine high school friends are visiting Korea together again after 20 years. Taipei's Wesley Girls High School has been selecting Korea as its graduation trip destination since 2004, with Chen's class being the first. I've been to Korea many times, as have my classmates. But this trip, coming back together, is even more special. Many places have changed a lot since we last visited, so we're experiencing a lot of the current Korean culture. We wore Ambo 20 years ago and will do so again tomorrow. We're really looking forward to it. After a welcoming ceremony on Tuesday, the group headed to One Million Dance Studio, the largest of its kind in Korea. There, they learned K-pop dance moves from chief choreographer Choi Young-jun. It was an unforgettable moment for Alex, one of Malaysia's biggest social media influencers with over 6 million followers on TikTok. Known for his K-pop dance covers, he was even named one of the best dancers of the day. I think K-pop has one of the best choreography and dance paired together. So I just started covering in my bedroom alone with my camera in front. So to be able to stand here and learn the choreography from the choreographer, choreographer himself was really meaningful to me because he represents everything that I've been standing for and my whole content as a general. And I think it will mean a lot to my followers as well. The day wrapped up with chimek, chicken, and baekju, which means beer in Korean. Participants enjoyed the beloved Korean combination of crispy fried chicken, fresh draft beer, and the traditional rice wine, makgeolli, toasting their future adventures in Korea. I'm half Korean. My mother is Korean. My father is English. And my special story with Korea is that I have learned so much about my culture through promoting it online. And I want to share that love with my followers. I host events. I, I do supper clubs. I teach people about hanbok and the history of Korean food and culture. And in doing that, I've learned more myself about Korean culture. The group will split into five subgroups, each exploring different themes like Korean culture, food, and wellness, before heading home on Friday. Song Yujin, Arirang News. The eastern parts of the country that were cool yesterday were hot today like it was early summer. The early summer heat continued across the country. If you look at today's highs, most parts of the country in yellow were as high as 30 degrees Celsius. Inland areas of Gyeongsangbuk-do province soared up to 31 degrees during the daytime. This heat will be seen tomorrow as well. This early summer-like conditions will continue for the rest of the week nationwide. However, there will be showers in western Gangwon-do and northern Gyeongsangbuk-do provinces on Friday. Tomorrow, Seoul will start off at 16 degrees, Daegu and Gwangju 17 degrees. Daily highs will move up to 26 in Seoul and Busan, Gyeongju 32 degrees. Rain is expected to begin in Seoul and other areas on the weekend and continue until Monday. That's all for Korea. Here are the weather conditions around the world.
And that is News Center for tonight. Thank you for watching. A panel session up next.